Alexa, what's the temperature? Right now, it's minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, let's go play some basketball. I'm open! It's not under pressure! Hey, chemistry folks, we're here to talk about gas notes. And that first part, kinetic molecular theory of gases, that's why. Why do gases act the way they do? That second part, gas laws, that's what. What do gases do? Let's use some math and figure out what do they do. So let's start again with kinetic molecular theory. Remember, that's the why of gases. Sometimes we just call it KMT. And there are five postulates for KMT. Postulates is just another fancy way of saying statements that describe the nature of a gas. First up, we have Gases are particles in a constant state of random motion and move in straight lines until they collide with each other or the wall of their container. So what I'd like you to do is think DVD. If you've seen that little logo bouncing around the screen, you've witnessed how a gas particle will behave. Let's go to number two. The volume occupied by the individual particles of a gas are negligible, which means like nothing, compared to the volume of the gas itself. So. A container of gas is mainly empty space. If you take a look at this picture, I've got a gas container that contains three liters of gas. Yep, when I put in those actual particles, you can barely see them. They don't take up much space at all, but the space of the overall gas is still three liters. Number three, pressure comes from collisions of the gas molecules on the walls of the container. That part about pressure coming from collisions, that's huge. We're gonna come back to that over and over again. Take a look at the DVD logo again. Every time it hits, that's what's causing the pressure. Number four, the particles of an ideal gas exert no attractive forces on each other or their surroundings. The collisions are elastic. Energy is conserved. On a side note, ideal gases, this term just means gases of different elements all behave similar. So we treat them equally with gas laws and equations. Whether you deal with chlorine gas, oxygen gas, fluorine gas, they all behave the same. And number five, the average kinetic energy, or moving energy, of gas molecules is directly proportional to the absolute temperature in Kelvin. Okay, now at this stage we have a problem. What's Kelvin? You've heard of Celsius, you've heard of Fahrenheit, but why do we have Kelvin? And to figure that out, we have to figure out what does zero really mean? When you have zero dollars, you have no money. When you have zero liters of soda, you have none. You're sad. When you run zero miles, you go nowhere. In all of these cases, zero really means zero. But if it's zero degrees Fahrenheit outside, and that's the temperature, which is the average kinetic energy, is there no kinetic energy when it's zero degrees Fahrenheit? Or zero degrees Celsius for that matter? Has all molecular motion stopped entirely? No, of course not. Molecules are still moving when it's zero degrees Fahrenheit. So in this case, zero really doesn't mean zero. So we had to come up with a temperature scale where zero really was zero. That's what Kelvin is for. So yes, at zero Kelvin, molecular motion actually would stop. Zero would mean zero. And the volume of a gas that shrinks as it gets colder would be zero liters at zero Kelvin. So here are the corresponding degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit that also equal absolute zero of zero K. So if we apply the fifth postulate, we can see that a hot gas will have a lot of kinetic energy. It'll be moving a lot, as seen in the DVD logo. Whereas a cold gas will not have much kinetic energy, as seen with the DVD logo moving very slowly. If you were to get it all the way down to zero Kelvin, that DVD logo would stop. So let's look at the gas that surrounds our Earth. That's our atmosphere. Gravity holds us to the surface of the Earth. It also holds gas. As we're closer to the surface of the Earth, you can see many more gas molecules bundled up together. As we get further and further out into the atmosphere, they are more spaced out. So close to the surface of the Earth, you have more air molecules. There's more pressure, there are more collisions, and there's higher density of air. But as you get higher up in the atmosphere, you have fewer molecules. You have less pressure, and there's a lower density of air. So let's consider you at sea level and your friend on the top of Mount Everest. You're both wearing a hat full of air. Your hat stretches all the way up into space and contains tons of air molecules. You've got a lot of pressure weighing on top of you. Now your friend on the top of Mount Everest, his hat isn't very tall at all and has very few molecules in it. He experiences less pressure. Down at sea level, you've got one atmosphere of pressure. Up on Mount Everest, you've only got about 0.33 atmospheres of pressure. Down at sea level, every breath you take is full of tons of air molecules. We're up on the top of that mountain, every breath your friend takes, 
doesn't have very many air molecules at all. That leaves it hard to breathe. That's why he's got to wear an oxygen mask. That's the same elevation that huge airplanes fly at. They make a fake pressure inside of the plane so you can stay alive. Now if that pressure is lost, that's when those little yellow masks fall down and you put them on to get the compressed air that you're used to at sea level. You and your friend will also have very different experiences when it comes to cooking. You down at sea level will go to make some mac and cheese and have the water boil at 100 degrees Celsius as you're used to. But up on the top of Mount Everest, there are fewer air molecules pressing down upon that water. So it's easier for that to go through its phase change as it will boil at only 77 degrees Celsius. It's also no coincidence that our Olympic Training Center is at an elevation of 6,000 feet. Athletes are able to adapt to this thin air or go down to sea level and experience games. In fact, in 2019, a Philadelphia sports radio host created a petition to try to ban professional sports in Denver because he felt it was unfair that those athletes always got to train in high altitude, while visiting teams are always left gasping for air. Let's consider Boyle's Law. In this equation, we have the pressure and the volume of a system before, and we compare it to the pressure and the volume of the system afterwards. This is an inverse relationship. As one thing goes up, the other one goes down, and vice versa. So if we take a look at an example, let's say we have a balloon that's at, oh, two atmospheres and a volume of four liters. If we were to apply a new pressure to it of four atmospheres, what would happen to the new volume? Once I do my math and solve for the unknown variable, I find that my new volume would be 2 liters. So, just as we said, as one thing goes up, the other goes down, and vice versa. So now we have a balloon that's smaller in size. Next, let's consider Charles' Law. In this situation, we're looking at the volume and the temperature of a gas before, and then changing things and looking at how the volume and the temperature respond. This is a direct relationship, meaning that as one goes up, the other one goes up, and vice versa. But since we're dealing with temperature in a ratio situation, zero needs to mean zero. That's why we end up using the Kelvin scale in these situations. So if we look at an example, and I've got a balloon that's at six liters and Let's make up some fake numbers to help our math work out a little better. I'm going to say it's at 2 Kelvin, which is ridiculously cold, like almost absolute zero. And then if I were to heat this balloon up to 300 Kelvin, I need to use my math to figure out what the new volume is. I cross multiply and find that the new volume of the gas is going to be 900 liters, which is ginormous, taking up the whole space. Let's go ahead and take 2002 Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man and say he's at the park with his helium balloon and he accidentally lets go of it. Oh no, what's going to happen to it? The balloon rises into the sky and he turns to his friend, Dr. Boyle, and says, hey, what's going to happen? Well, Boyle will look at this as an inverse relationship. He knows that when it goes way up high into the sky, there's going to be less pressure up there. So he says as the pressure goes down, the volume should go up. The balloon's going to get huge. But then his other friend, Dr. Charles, says, whoa, 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 I know that when it gets way high up in the sky, it's going to be really cold. So as the temperature goes down, the volume should go down. So we've got a problem. Boyle says it's going to go up. Charles says it's going to go down. So what we've realized is that we can put these two formulas together. Boyle's and Charles work together to make what we call the combined gas law. PV over T before equals the PV over T afterwards. Now when I plug my numbers in, uh, again, just using totally fake numbers to try to make our math a little easier. I've got to do some cross multiplying and some work there, and I find out that the new volume is 8 liters. So for this hypothetical situation, the volume went from 4 to 8 liters, and Boyle's is the one who won. And finally, let's take a look at the ideal gas law. In this situation, we're not dealing with a before and after. We're looking at right now, what is the gas like? It's PV equals NRT. The P stands for pressure, measured in atmospheres. The V is volume, measured in liters. The N stands for moles, measured in moles. The R is known as the gas constant. It's 0.0821, and the units are kind of funky. Atmospheres, liters over moles, Kelvin. And finally, we have temperature. That's measured in Kelvin. Remember, we've got to turn things into Kelvin so our math works out correctly. Zero needs to mean zero. When we're doing this, sometimes you'll also hear a term known as STP, standard temperature and pressure. Whenever we talk about that, standard temperature is known as 273 Kelvin, and the pressure is known as 1 atmosphere. Those are always numbers given to you. So if we had the question, at STP, one mole of gas takes up how much space? I could use the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, and plug in my values for STP and find out that the volume is 22.4 liters. And in fact, that's the molar volume of all gases at STP, 22.4 liters. That's a number that you get used to using when you're doing stoichiometry and gas laws.
Where's the pressure? 